As I have said in my other videos, some of my other videos, all spiritual people, all religious people of all traditions all over the world are living some form of a negotiated compromise between the world of the ideal and the world of the, re the real world and the ideal world. If, we're, if you're a practicing Christian, you are to some degree reading the Bible and trying to embody the teachings of the Bible to live in ideal, to live in the ideal world. But we all live in the here and now, and we all have to make our compromise somewhere in the here and now. You have, a lot of you have everyday mundane responsibilities that are, make up, constitute the, the sum total of the real world. You got families to feed, you got you know, bills to pay, things like that. I'm not saying this is a defect, I'm just saying this is how it is. The problem comes when people don't cop to it, when they don't own it. Even the most literal literalist that ever walked the face of the earth, I don't care if you're the most sold out Bible literalist that ever lived, they live to one degree in the real world. Matter of fact, part of the reason why we have so much fundamentalists enter so much of our conversation is because they have an outside influence right here in the United States of America. Why? Because they have a really good operational understanding of the real world. Honest to God, that's why, we, that's why we talk about them, because they understand the making of money and they understand politics. And those are two of the main obsessions of the real world. The real world out there functions on mechanics and mechanics alone. The Bible talks about the difference between living a life of the spirit and living a life of the flesh. To a certain extent, it is possible to see the entire real world, the buying and selling of products, commerce, what we call society, as almost its sole, the sole underlying premise of all commerce. Now, this isn't completely true, but it's largely true, is selling products to your flesh, ministering to your flesh. Think about how the real world actually operates. You go to a store, you buy what? Something you want. You turn on TV and what happens? You see commercials. What are they trying to do? Convince you to buy something. Convince you to want something even more. Convince you to get something you want. And that's the whole engine of commerce is, can be summed up in that. To, to a certain degree. I'm speaking metaphorically. It's not literally true. It's metaphorically true. Now Christianity teaches you to devalue the real world a lot. Radically in favor of the ideal world. Paul says, I count all things as dung. And Paul meant it. What we have here in the United States of America, okay, is most of the Christ practicing Christians live one foot in the real world and one foot in the world of their ideas. So when you go to church on Sunday or Wednesday and you're trying to be a really good Christian, you try and bring some of that spirit into work with you, a little, but doesn't fully work. Why? Because it's the real world. And the real world makes demands on your time, it makes demands on your energy drains you so you're not super spiritual by the time like you know Tuesday rolls around you're kind of mad at the world and like stressed out and like yeah, yeah love your neighbors yourself ah, you know you want to kill somebody why because the real world makes demands of you the flesh is flesh the spirit is spirit they are in conflict one with the other that's kind of what that means or this least at least one way of perceiving that reality now, let's take the most fundamentalist Christians that, that ever walked the face of the earth. Part of the reason why we talk about them so much in present day United, United States of America is because, honest to God, they have really good operational understanding of how the real world works. They have an outsized, outsized influence in this country. And that's because they understand two things really well, the making of money and political influence. And those are both some obsessions of the real world. Those are real-world understandings, real-world knowledge. You just think, okay, think of it this way. You think Ken Ham is like the dumbest guy on the face of the earth, right? Ken Ham's so dumb, I can't believe he's a superstitious idiot. Last time I looked, he spent $150 million to build that Noah's Ark, to build that museum. They raised $150 million. Which atheist group do you know that can raise $150 million to do anything? Nobody. I can't raise $150 million. You can't? No, I can't. I can't even come close. I wouldn't even know where to begin. So what does that speak to? It speaks to real world operational understanding of the mechanics of the real world. 
how to influence politicians and how to raise money. Those are real world knowledgeable things. Those are things that atheists say they're super gay for, but don't really know how to do in the real world. Honestly. They're really, you know, super gay for, for cause and effect, scientific principles, things like that. Well, well the, the Ken Ham Christian put them into effect in the real world, and they bought a, a whole museum because they raised $150 million and then they influenced the political process really strongly. That's why we talk about them so much in the United States of America, because they have a much bigger, they're punching above their weight class. They're raising more money and they're influencing the pol political process far in, far surpassing their actual numbers. What does that speak to? Operational understanding of the real world. Good, solid operational understanding. I'm not talking about their theology. I'm not saying they're correct, theologically speaking. I'm just saying they know something because they're putting it into effect in the here and now. The atheist experience is probably the biggest atheist group. Can they even raise a million dollars? I don't know. Could they? Maybe they raised that a year. Maybe. I'd be surprised. I'm guessing it's more like half a million if it's even that. I have no idea how much money they make, but I'd be surprised if it's a million. Could be. Could be. Maybe that's low. Maybe it's two million. I don't really know. But it's not 150 million. Ken Ham, Ken Ham Christians are punching way above their weight class in their operational understanding of the real world. That's reality. That's why we talk about them so much. Why? Because they have outsized influence on our political process. Because they understand mechanics. Mechanics. Things that atheists pretend they understand and pretend they care about and pretend they're obsessed with but don't really understand. They understand it better than you. The numbers don't lie. They understand it better than you. Now, where am I going with this? Like I said, Paul tells you to radically devalue not just devalue the world of the real world in favor of the ideal world, but to radically devalue it. Okay? And very few Christians actually do. Most Christians live with one foot in the real world and one foot in the ideal world. I'm not saying this is a defect. I'm not saying that's wrong of them. The only thing I'm saying is cop to it. Own it. Instead of, there's a huge disparity between what Christians practice and what they preach. And there needn't be. Preach from where you live. Preach from what you can practice in effect. Like I said, it's actually harder to do than you think. You read your holy book on Sunday, you get all, you know, psyched up on Jesus and how you're going to be a great loving human being. By the time Tuesday rolls around, you're just like everyone else. You want to kill everyone around you. Because that's how the real world operates. It's stressful. It demands of you. It belittles spiritual. It belittles human values in favor of what? Process. Mechanics. Buying and selling of products. In the ultimate, in the ultimate metaphorical truth, most of you are mere cogs in a machine. That's what they used to call you, the mere cog. I'm the mere cog in the machine. Hey, what do you do for a living? I don't know. I just go somewhere and, and, and you know, write little things on this and stamp this and push down. I'm the mere cog in the machine, dude. That's the honest of God truth. The real world functions as a machine. And most of us use it to buy, you know, put food on a table, feed our families, feed our kids. I'm not saying that's a defect of the person. I'm just saying that's reality. We, be, we, di we connect to the machine, we become a cog in the machine for a little bit, and then we go back and we take that to try and build a life for ourselves. The real thing that I'm saying is there's a big, huge disparity in you, the Christian, between what you practice and what you preach. Promise with all of you, own it. Own it. Preach from where you live. Don't preach from... Everybody knows. Newsflash. Everybody knows. That's where hypocrisy lives and breeds. When everybody falls short of the glory of God, everybody falls short of the mark. That's what this means. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That includes you. That includes a lot of people. Maybe even me. Maybe even me. I'm not saying definitely me, but maybe. Possibly. Includes everybody. Own it. Own it. Not only will you be better served by owning it, but more importantly, your congregation or your people that you're influencing in life, the people around you that you're trying to get to see that there's value in a Christian walk will be a thousand times better served 
Preach from where you are. Don't preach from the ideal that you aren't hitting, because that's where hypocrisy lives and breeds. It's where hypocrisy lives and breeds. And I'll go into a story on that in another video. I'm running out of time on this one. So that's all for now. Amen.